Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage President and CEO of the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, Madeline Swan Tran Milka. Good morning, everyone. I am Madeline Milka, President and CEO of APAX, the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. I am thrilled to welcome you to the 2023 APAX Legislative Leadership Summit, and we are so honored to have you all here today with us. As you know, public policy touches all of us, and this summit brings together nonprofit and corporate leaders, subject matter experts, as well as local, state, and federal elected officials to share their insights and expertise on some of the most pressing issues facing the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community. With panels on voting rights, diversity and leadership, education, and healthcare, this summit will provide a platform for us to learn from one another and to identify ways to improve the lives of all Americans. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our premium summit partners, Amazon, AT&T, Johnson & Johnson, Meta, State Farm, and all of our special guest speakers, panelists, and moderators. Your support enables APAX to fulfill its mission of promoting AA and NHPI participation and representation at all levels of the political process, from community service to elected office. Please download the guidebook app by scanning the QR code on the screens so that you can see our schedule and learn more about the speakers. You can use this virtual program book to find detailed information on the speakers and the summit schedule. Next, I have the pleasure to introduce John Quintus to deliver opening remarks for the summit. John is the Director of Inclusive Communities for Amazon's Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion team and is deeply committed to addressing the unique challenges facing the military community. Prior to joining Amazon, John served 29 years in the US Air Force, retiring as a Brigadier General. In his final assignment, John was the Asia Policy and Strategy Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. John Quintus. Wow, good morning. Thank you, Madeline, uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning and to be able to help open this year's Legislative Leadership Summit. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Tanya Layden, APAX, and all of you here that are participating and supporting um, this year's conference. Uh, it's an honor for me, really, to be part of uh, the incredible lineup of leaders, uh, including our co-chairs, the Honorable Tammy Duckworth, who is a fellow mili military aviator like myself, uh, and the Honorable Mark Ticano, along with Ambassador Catherine Tai and the Honorable Maisie Hirono, and many, many more distinguished participants. Um, as was said, my name is, is John Quintus, and I am a director of um, inclusion, equity, uh, and diversity at Amazon. Amazon prides itself uh, as a company of builders, inventing on behalf of our customers. And we know that successful innovation is fueled by our diversity. We are committed to DEI being part of everything that we do. And we believe that if we get this right at Amazon, we can create a greater sense of inclusion, not only at Amazon, but making an enormous impact for all of our customers and our communities that we serve. Helping to build a world where everyone can live with dignity and free from fear. Amazon also believes that the um, Asian American uh, voices need to be heard and need to be bold. We have an affinity group at Amazon called Asians at Amazon that boasts more than 20,000 employees in their membership. The group promotes cultural awareness and improves diversity at Amazon through recruiting and hiring programs that connect employees through their shared experiences. They host local community events and they participate in service programs like Walk for Rice and Kinon. This month, Asians at Amazon is leading um, programming with a the theme of rising together, unity in diversity celebrating our rich cultural heter heritages as well as the achievements of Asian Pacific Americans. 
I'd also like to highlight that over the last two years, Amazon Studios, which is led by Albert Chang, the Vice President of Prime Video, has developed a program called Amazon Studios Voices. And it's a platform that we use to have conversations to help build community around diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. It has been used to champion and explore how we can collectively make the entertainment industry more inclusive, including specific uh, facilitated discussions about Hollywood's role in anti-Asian racism and talking about how leaders can drive change, including bolstering Asian Pacific Islander representation in the film and media. We're also proud to say that Amazon for the last two years has been a very proud contributor to the Asian American Foundation's Giving Challenge. We've committed $10 million to support the organization's pursuit of belonging and prosperity and freedom from discrimination, slander, and violence. Amazon recognizes that with our success comes broad responsibility. And we all have a part to play in bridging the biases that divide us, leading and using our talents to build a brighter future for tomorrow. We recognize May as Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month, but we know that our works and our community cannot be relegated to just a single month. Our contributions are too immense, too important. I want to thank you for all of you, your passion and your energy that you bring here over the next few days. Uh, I know that together, we the people can empower our community and change the world for the better. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage moderator Frank Wu and our distinguished panel. Good morning, friends. I'm afraid my suit didn't make it on the flight, so I'm doing this as I was yesterday in Yosemite, where I ran a half marathon. It's uh, great to be here. We welcome as panelists Julia Jinka, who's the Senior Vice President at Asian Pacific Islander American Scholars. She's also a professor with Cornell teaching public policy. And Estella Owima Church, who uh, is uh, the head of EPIC, a national organization advocating for Pacific Islanders. She is herself of both Samoan and Nigerian descent, one of uh, the most award-winning teachers in the state of California, and the first Pacific Islander uh, to have won award after award as a teacher, uh, something that she did uh, for two decades before taking on her current role. This panel is about education, and specifically higher education, which for so many Asian American families has been the engine of that proverbial American dream. Whether they came as scholarship students or whether uh, they came fleeing war and famine, for so many who look like those in this room, your parents, your grandparents, perhaps you yourself, it's the opportunity to gain higher education that has meant social mobility here whether people have started at a four-year institution such as Queens College, which I had, or one of our sister two-year institutions, there are so many Asian Americans uh, pursuing their degrees and by that pursuing their dreams. Yet Asian Americans also face issues that others don't acknowledge. The model minority myth with the burden of succeeding at extraordinary levels only in a limited number of fields, being denied the full range of human expression, assumed not to have any problems. And Asian Americans now increasingly are prominent in these discussions that we have about higher education policy, sometimes not to help other people of color, but seemingly in opposition to programs meant to advance diversity. These are just some of the issues that we'll take on in this morning's session. It's wonderful uh, to be here with APAX, uh, with their uh, conference that means so much to those of us 
who care about Asian Americans being included in these discussions of our diverse democracy. By the way, my name is Frank Wu. I'm the president of Queens College, part of the City University of New York. Let's get started with our two distinguished panelists. If you would tell us a little bit more about your organization, what it is you do, and how you help Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders achieve higher education aspirations. Mahalo, soy fu, talo falava, olo uingo o, estela uima church. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, us, sunga, I am executive director of Empowering Pacific Islander Communities. We are a pro black, pro indigenous organization that advances social justice on behalf of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders through research, advocacy, leadership development, um, and narrative change. Um, one of our a large part of our origin story is our leadership development program called Pilot, Pacific Islander Leaders of Tomorrow. Uh, it's a summer institute that we host for um, Pacific Islander undergraduates who are just coming into um, a very important part of their identity voyage and are looking for ways to engage, um, to be activated and uh, advocate on behalf of our communities. Um, I am about nine months in to um, being ED here at Epic, but I was a high school theater educator for the last 11 years and before that a college counselor um, for about six, seven years. Um, so shout out to my union siblings who are in the audience. NEA, CTA, what up y'all? Um, I, one part, uh, an important part of my story, so um, my mother is from the village of uh, Satufia, Samoa. My father's from Calabo, Nigeria. I'm the daughter of immigrants, first gen, born and raised by Tongva land. Um, and uh, I only got to college um, because of educational opportunity program. I was a special admit. And one issue that impacts our community greatly is this issue around affirmative action um, and the ways it impacts our communities probably differently, in part uh, because of that model minority myth. But um, yeah, for myself, if it was not for EOP offering me a special admit spot at Cal State Northridge, I would not be a college graduate. I wouldn't have a master's degree. I would not have gone on to earn uh, my teacher cr teaching credential. Um, and I think that, that programs like that and uh, reframing the conversation around creating a college-going culture in K-12 spaces and P-20 spaces um, has to include programs like EOP, has to include conversations around community college, has to include uh, very specific um, ways to support our dreamers and immigrant students and has to include uh, comprehensive transfer programs to support students going on to anything beyond a two-year degree. Um, but I'll pause there. That's to my Let me ask a follow-up question, yeah. though. Uh, you have done work on data disaggregation. That's a very important issue. All too often when we talk about Asian American and Pacific Islander, we don't get to the Pacific Islander. I think it's important to acknowledge that. And when it comes to diversity programs, regrettably, there's also division, tension among Asian Americans, with some of the most vocal advocates against the programs being themselves Asian American. Would you like to speak to that? Yeah, um, I think Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander organizations, we've been calling in our Asian American siblings to that conversation for quite some time. Um, majority of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students, if they pursue a college education, we found that they're most likely gonna, gonna make a stop at a community college prior to going on to a four-year university. Um, and if straight to the four-year university is an option, Oftentimes, programs like EOP, EAOP, the Educational Access Opportunity Programs are absolutely essential to not only getting their spot in college, um, but helping them uh, navigate the system once they are in that higher ed institution, which is not easy to do. Um, 
this system, quite frankly, is, was never designed or created with our communities in mind. Uh, and that continues to be true in the way that it functions and we're forced to navigate the system as opposed to being welcome into spaces that are 100% created with our culture in mind, with who we are at the center of it. Um, and so, yeah, I'll stop there. Cause I, All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, we'll continue this conversation. Uh, Julie, you work on these issues as well, and I know that you care about the pipeline, and about half of Asian American and Pacific Islander students do start at some point in a two-year institution. Yet sometimes when we talk about these issues, it's as if everyone who's Asian American and Pacific Islander is at an Ivy and it's only about scholarships to go to the most elite institutions. Maybe you could reframe this for us about the diversity of the Asian American population in higher education. Sure, thanks so much, Frank. <clears throat> Excuse me, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think that you know, for those of you who are unfamiliar with APIA scholars, that's a perfect place to start because our origin story as the nation's leading nonprofit that provides students from our community who want to go to college the opportunity to do so is really about busting that model minority myth that there are no financial barriers within our communities. And time after time again, costs are showing up as the most important barrier for students to go to college and get through college from our communities. But the important thing is, you know, costs show up differently for our families, for first generation, second generation, third generation. You know, typically family responsibilities, different financial burdens that we're working with aren't accounted for in the traditional financial aid calculators, right? So APIA scholars came on the scene 20 years ago uh, we're very excited, this is our 20th year, um, to actually distribute scholarship dollars to so many students in our communities. Over the past 20 years, we've distributed over $150 million. But we also know that there's important work to be done in tandem with distributing those dollars. And that means being good partners with a lot of the campuses. Um, many of them are community colleges, minority serving institutions where nearly half of our students are attending. Um, and then also really making sure that we're doing the important research that demonstrates the diversity of our student body. We know that two thirds of our scholars actually live at or below poverty level. We know three quarters of our scholars are the first in their families to go to college. And so when we gather this research, we find it really, really important to get it into the hands of folks who can actually do something about it. And it's really about um, you know, explaining this diversity and what it looks like for our communities in a new way to folks who are you know, making, um, making you know, everyday decisions about affordability in this country and what college has actually meant. So uh, tell us more about MSIs, Minority Serving Institutions and ANAPESIs, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander designation. That's a federal category. And how do ANAPESIs fit into this picture with MSIs? Sure. So, you know, just interested, how many folks in this room have actually heard of Anapesis? Okay, that's great. <laughs> and I think this is absolutely a well-informed room. What's terrifying is that when I talk to crowds who are working every day in and out of higher education policy, Anapesis are still not as well known as our wonderful counterparts from other communities, Hispanic serving institutions, certainly HBCUs, tribal colleges and universities. And so I think that's really an important place to start, that this designation is fairly new on the landscape of higher ed, but what it means is that, you know, back in 2007, we were paying attention to our fast-growing student populations and how there are 
a small minority of campuses, about 6% of colleges and universities in this country are serving over 40% of our students. And so this designation came about to say there are significant concentrations of our students going to certain colleges and universities. And those universities and campuses should be receiving federal support to do what they know how to do best. So it means, you know, at a lot of these institutions, they are the programs that are actually figuring out how students who are English learners cannot fall behind, but actually be accelerated in their success. These are communities that understand what it means to create a sense of belonging, our starting fantastic curriculum that incorporates our identities and makes us feel welcome on campus. But the big problem is that because ANA PCs are still less known, um, they are not receiving equitable funding. And when we're talking about um, inequities, you know, per capita, ANA PCs are receiving drastically the lowest amount of federal funding. There are about 199 colleges and universities that are eligible for this funding right now, but only 40 are receiving funding. So we're really trying to make sure that we're in conversations where these funding decisions are made to make sure that campuses that are serving our students can actually get the federal dollars that they need. That's great. I know that for my institution, Queens College, we're both HSI, Hispanic Serving, and on a PZ, and we just actually received a multi-year, multi-million dollar on a PZ grant, which will allow us to provide in-language services, culturally appropriate services, the sort of thing that we to be honest, just weren't doing enough of before. But now, with the federal funding, we can. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the disparities and differences. Many people, even those who work on civil rights issues or social justice, don't realize that Asian Americans display more income disparity than any other demographic group. And people sometimes wonder, how can that be? Well, it's because when you disaggregate and when you look, you see that Asian Americans show two very different streams of migration. And when you look at Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians, you see how complex it, the picture becomes and that this one label groups within it so many different communities, all with different needs. So there are are significant numbers, for example, of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders now in the criminal justice system, and that's something that we're not mindful of. Would you like to comment and, and help teach us? Yeah, so um, one, I don't want to say misconception, I think it's just uh, just general ignorance around uh, what comprises the Pacific Island or Islander community, and uh, it's easy to assume Polynesians only because Samoans, Tongans tend to be the folks that we see in higher numbers um, or are most visible in our community. But Pacific Islanders also includes Micronesia and Melanesia. And a lot of the differences, or I should say the ways that we are able to access resources once in the US are dictated by our home islands relationship with colonialism and the US empire. Um, and uh, it just, it trickles all the way down. So when I decided to become an educator, I decided to move back home to South LA where my mom grew up once she came from Samoa to Hawaii and then to California. Um, because growing up I thought, yeah, this, yeah, I'm used to seeing other black Pacifica folks here. Um, and so when I decided to become a teacher, I moved right back home to where I assumed the Black Pacifica kids will be, um, and that's where I, could, I would do the most service for my community um, growing up in diaspora. But when I got to Hawthorne High School, there were only four Tongan kids on our campus, and I was very confused. I was like, where, where did all the kids go? Because we were here when I was younger. Um, and it became very obvious after my first year of teaching that it was because of the lack of data to SAG or equitable data period um, 
we weren't actually meeting the needs of students in our community. And so many of our families were starting to move elsewhere. Add to that some displacement, gentrification, uh, lack of jobs and other social issues that just kind of pile up and educators are used to, to dealing with all of the intersection of all of those, those issues. Um, but that was one of the reasons families were moving because we didn't have the data in order to assess the needs of our PI families and then respond. Um, and so what we are learning now through narrative and some CBOs or community-based orgs that are doing the data disaggregation on their own, um, there's a rising number where the largest and fastest growing population in California prisons, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders and Southeast Asians. Um, there is a bill now in California, disaggregate the other, because we're all lumped into other. That, like that's it, it's not even AAPI. Um, it's just other. Um, and so again, there's, there's data lacking there. Um, what we've also found, uh, ACLU and a few other civil rights orgs a couple years ago did a, a deep dive into disciplinary um, and found overwhelmingly that black students were over-disciplined across the nation, um, which leads to the school to prison pipeline and the push out of black girls. And next to black communities, it's Pacific Islanders. Pacific Islander girls who are pushed out of public K-12 institutions at higher rates disproportionately to all other communities of color. Um, again, leading to the school to prison pipeline. Um, and we don't have enough, we don't know enough in order to meet their needs um, once they're, or when they're coming up through the K-12 system. Um, but it also impacts the ways teachers are able to move through college, which we've already spoken to, um, and then it, it then shows up as PI students not having classrooms where they have Native Hawaiian and PI educators that look like them, that understand what they're going through, that knows what it means to, to maybe grow up in a, a multi-generational household and how that impacts your after-school life, right? Like having PI students on my drama teams meant that I understood that there were certain days my kiddos were gonna be at church and don't, don't have rehearsal on the days that my kids are gonna be at church because they had to go to church, right? Like those very little cultural, I don't wanna say little, but it's an easy concession or accommodation to make that if we are unaware of what our kids are going through, we can't meet their needs on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are reams of studies now that show that when there's a teacher who is a role model or a doctor who looks like their patient, the outcomes are better. So this isn't just out of pride or a sense that we, we need to have our share. You can see that the student learning outcomes improve. You know, you've had some success in San Francisco with the Samoan language program and San Bernardino with the Pacific Islander Task Force. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what's happening in California that's positive and how did you achieve those, those gains? I can't take credit. Um, what EPIC is working on now, we're supporting uh, United Teachers of Los Angeles and their Ethnic Studies Task Force to uh, convene NHMPI educators, students, um, and families in order to do some community-based participatory research, um, hoping that we are able to provide really strong recommendations for uh, state ed departments, but also at the federal, federal level, um, and hoping that we're able to impact policy using uh, that community-based research. But in the research, um, and as we pull together community leaders for our advisory group, what we have found is that up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Unified, because there were Pacific Islanders on the school board, um, a resolution passed a few years ago to push the district to recount the students in their district. Um, because a report a little bit before that from the Pew Center had found that more than half of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders actually identify as mixed race or multi-ethnic. Enter example number one. Um, and so we aren't showing up in either sets of data, right? Like we're not showing up in the NHPI data, I'm not showing up in black 
data, right? Um, and so when, they, when, the, when San Francisco Unified recounted, they found that there were three times more Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students in their district than they thought they had originally had, and this led to the district being able to advocate for a Samoan dual language program. I am willing to bet it's the only one. Uh, a Samoan dual language program is, it's wild, it's amazing, like I love the fact that that exists. Um, meanwhile, in San Bernardino City Unified, um, their equity team has placed a Chamorro educator at the head of their PI task force. And so now there's a team, an equity team, created just to support our NHPI families in that district. Um, and so how EPIC is supporting is gathering all of the best examples, the best practices, so that we can compile the report and share uh, with our local districts but mo most importantly, equip our families with a bank of resources, resolution language, and um, other things that they might need to take action at their local school boards and demand that the districts count our families, count our students, so that we have in-language supports when our parents and grandparents need them, um, so that students have access to um, on a PC college is like they should be visiting our high school campuses so kids are aware that those resources exist so that we can support MANA programs and PISA programs, our, our PI student orgs across our community colleges um, so that they're also visiting our high schools and middle schools. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what's been going on. That's great. Uh, Julie, would you like to offer the context for this? You look at the data, the demographic change and the category of more than one race is the fastest growing within Asian American Pacific Islander, which itself is the fastest growing of the racial demographic groups. Would you like to add some detail? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> just to really double down on what Estelle is sharing, this data disaggregation problem continues throughout the education pipeline. And what we've been seeing in some of our research um, with some partners at UCLA is on college campuses, when individuals are counted, they're being inaccurately counted. Which individuals? Particularly our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander peers. And that's because, like Estella said, such a significant percentage, you know, over half, of our students are identifying as two or more race, but there's also a more insidious problem in the way we're collecting data, which is that you know, when a student identifies themselves as Hispanic, for instance, they don't have the opportunity to be counted as any other race, right, or any other category. And so what happened is we saw that at one campus, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, we knew that there were a really high number of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students, yet they were not showing up in the data that was being reported to the Department of Education. And so a research team at UNLV really led a process to figure out what's going on here. And they saw that most of the NHPI students were being categorized as two or more race or Hispanic. And so the Department of Ed was only seeing 200 NHPI students show up in their data when really there was more than 1,600, right? So we're not talking about insignificant underreporting. We're talking about a critical issue in the way that we collect data on our students. And, you know, as Frank mentioned, we are sort of the future of this country, right? It's our communities who have been identifying as from more than one subgroup, and we're growing really quickly, and if we don't get ahead of this problem now, while we are taking this sort of once in a generation opportunity to rethink how we classify race and ethnicity on our census and every other form, we're gonna be kicking ourselves, you know, a couple of decades from now because we didn't think ahead to say, you can be more than one, and we still need to know exactly what those subgroups are to figure out, you know, which groups need more resources, right? Need more opportunity. 
Um, and so I really think as part of the data disaggregation conversation, it would be really, really wonderful to start paying attention to how our communities are reporting multiple races. That's great. There's so much for us to talk about, and dialogue is at the heart of the democratic process. So let's open the floor for questions from the audience. We have about 12 minutes left, and so there's uh, ample time. Uh, don't be like students and, and sit quietly while the teacher is up here thinking, please, someone ask a question. And I promise not to do what law professors do, which is to say, that's a good question, what do you think? All right, I see a hand over there. Do, do we have uh, microphones for the audience members who wish to ask a question? Yes, uh, the, someone is running a microphone to you, sir. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ricardo Sanchez. I work for Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, excellent panel. Thank you very much uh, for, 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 for all this knowledge. Uh, so as, as a person of color, uh, I'm an immigrant from Colombia. I understand the difficulties of getting to higher education. That is, I want to say, one of the, the, the first really, really big challenges that we have into kind of coming in and, 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 and making our own, right? Uh, from my perspective, uh, representing my company, we're doing a lot of work to try to change the dynamics from higher education into diversifying our workforce. Uh, we're putting a lot of resources into this, but we also need people from perspectives such as mine who has lived through it. Um, and so my challenge with my company is, okay, how do, we, how do we fix this problem, right? We have resources, uh, but I, I, I tend to feel that we are looking at always in the same places, right? Because we have established relationships, so it makes sense, right? We're going to the same universities, we're going to the same recruiting pools is what I call them. I'm here, just, you know, just one person out of many in the company, trying to help change that. Uh, what are your, uh, some advice, where else can we go to find this talent that is just untapped resources uh, that we can help create uh, more pipelines for this diversity? Not in, 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 just in, in any field, right? We have STEM fields in my, in my, in my field, of course. I do government relationship, uh, so it's uh, policy, all of these different fields. That's a great question. So what would you say to this audience? We have uh, people from the private sector, uh, people from holding high office. We have leaders of every type. In concrete terms, what yeah. is the ask here that you would make of this audience? Folks might disagree with my response, but I'm going to go with it anyway. So um, what I am seeing is that, that I, th I think a lot of folks who have gone through college and, and got their fancy degrees forget that they were once a K-12 student. Um, building successful pathways, and I, I do work hard to avoid the word pipeline because of the implications around disproportionate impact on our kids in the prison system, but what we want are really strong pathways from early education all the way through to higher ed because our kids aren't getting to the four-year schools or to your organization unless they've had really strong K-12 um, experiences. And there are two things that I think give those very positive, well-rounded experiences. One is access to quality ethnic studies. Number two is fully funded arts education. When kids have access to ethnic studies, all the studies show that they are more likely to graduate and to feel safe and to feel like, you know, they can do anything. Add to that a quality arts education. Guess what? I'm a drama kid. <laughs> uh, and folks used to ask me all the time as an educator, why is it always the drama students who are leading the protest and walking out and doing all these? Well, it's because drama gave them all the skills they needed to be the advocates for their communities that they needed to be. Um, and so going up and into any of their careers was, was easier for them to do. Uh, not, you know, not to say that they weren't going to face challenges, but they had a really strong skill set um, to do so. And my drama kids, I used to tell them all the time, please don't major in theater when you go to college. I already did it for you. Do something else. Because the, the idea or the premise is, if these students are across all industry sectors, imagine how more empathetic and human-centered every industry sector could be. That's great. Julie, concrete 
proposals? What, what, what's the ask of this audience? What advice do you have? Yeah, I really appreciate the question. And I think fundamentally it comes down to reaching out to the campuses that aren't the first in mind, right? Aren't the top of the recruiting list just because that's the way it's always been done. And you know, APIA Scholars partners with 33 Ana PC colleges and universities around the country. So we'd be happy to connect folks to actually figure out where you can go and do more proactive outreach where we can connect them with opportunities at your companies, internships, apprenticeships, mentors, right? It really means thinking outside of the box and getting outside of that really narrow understanding of where students from our communities go to. And you know, it's going back to Frank's original question, talking about these divisive conversations that are happening right now about race-based college admissions, where a very vocal group of um, individuals sounds like they're against affirmative action, but it just means that we need to be more vocal on the other side of it because when we actually sent out a survey to 22,000 high school students, college students, alum, asking a whole host of questions about how they experience education, 80% of the individuals who responded to our survey were in favor of affirmative action because they understand that it is actually a system that is helping individuals who the system has not been created for have an access point. Just in the same way it's been done for vets and women in the past. And so I think it's really important to just highlight that there are individuals from our community who are supportive of our communities coming together as communities of color. Um, and we have to be more vocal than the ones who are right now. If you just send me an email, I'll send you 10 interns. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, we have time uh, for some closing statements. Oh, we, we have one, one more question. Yeah, so uh, over here, if we could run a mic over here. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Hallie Fuchs. I'm with the National Wooden Pallet and Container Association. This is an amazing panel, but I do want to touch on the alternative career pathways. Like, what are ways that we can tap in to in, in K through 12 to say that there are alternatives besides four-year, two-year colleges that people can go get a technical career, they can work in manufacturing. Uh, again, there's such a labor shortage right now in manufacturing as, as I know in my industry. So I, I guess just, and also how do we break down, I think like internalize like stereotypes among like the AAPI community of like you, you, you have to go to college. There's no other way to have a successful career and a life. So thank you. So in, in one yeah. minute. I uh, appreciate the question because those are my closing statements. So the other uh, thing that aside from ethnic studies and uh, arts ed, it's career tech ed. Supporting really strong career tech ed pathways across all the industry sectors will help create a pool in high school. Add to that, avoiding AP and honors courses. I know they sound prestigious, but the stronger path is to uh, support dual and concurrent enrollment at your students' high schools so that not only do we cut the cost of a four-year college, but students are graduating from high school now with certifications to go straight into the workforce as opposed to having to go into a four-year university. Thank you. Uh, a brief comment about alternatives and career tech education? Julie? I'll second everything Estella just said. <laughs> All right. So, We'll start, oh, uh, one last question over here. If we could run a microphone uh, over to. Okay, all right, that's good. Stand up, speak out. So my question is to Dr. Julie, how many Pacific Islanders do you give scholarships to? And how many applications do you get? Yeah, that's a great question, and so, not enough, that is the answer. Um, and we are really doubling down um, in our, we've just finished a very exciting strategic planning process of how to really dig into the communities that we need to do the most supportive outreach to. And so this means actually going to not only the Pacific region and being much more proactive with recruiting applications from high schools, but also thinking about the communities on the mainland that have very high percentages of 
Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. And so we are going to be doing much more proactive outreach and we would love to work in partnership with organizations that can help get the word out about our applications. Because even the numbers that apply to us are not high enough and we realize that that's, that's on us to actually get the word out. Oh no, no, more than 10, yeah. <laughs> Um, we absolutely, I mean, so we hand out about, this year it's roughly 500 um, scholarships, and so it will be a small percentage. We haven't reported on our numbers this year, but it's going to be, I mean, I, I don't want to throw out an incorrect number, but it is low. But they're working on it. So yes. I can see the next panel waiting in the wings. We'll <laughs> wrap up with some closing statements from each of our panelists. I'll try to sum up uh, with just three points. All law professors make three points when they speak. The first is uh, that this is a rapidly changing population. The second is that it's a complex population. It's not monolithic. It's not the model minority through and through. And third and finally, as probably most of you know, and you'll hear throughout this conference, it's a population with needs, with distinctive needs that often are overlooked, ignored, or pushed to the side. We have just enough time for 30 second closing statements. We'll start with Estella. I am calling in my Asian American siblings and relatives to center the most marginalized in our communities and advocate for critical Pacific Island and Oceania studies um, and, and Asian American studies, not at the expense of our other communities. Great, uh, Julie. I would love for our communities to start seeing you know, our linguistic abilities as an asset instead of a deficit. You know, my first language was not English, it was Marathi, and my parents got very scared when I went to school that I wouldn't be able to keep up, and so they switched wholesale, which meant, meant that I lost my ability to connect with my family, my grandparents, and it started this whole series of hiding who I was in order to succeed. When in reality, I really think it's that ability of going between cultures, between languages, that is one of our greatest strengths. And so I would love for students to really be highlighting those strengths. Part of what this conference shows is that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians, neither black nor white, not fitting into either box may perhaps help to redefine those boxes. What were once margins are making a new mainstream. Thank you so much for joining us in this, the very first panel of APAC's conference. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I think we have a photo op. Hold on one moment.